Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Well, last week I showed you how the automatic block signaling system that Jeff Sherb designed actually works here on the benchtop. And this week I'm going to show you how I went about building these circuits because there is a history behind this. So let's get started. <laughs> Before we go on, I want to ask you to take a moment to subscribe to the channel. It's simple, easy, and free. All you have to do is hit that little red uh, subscribe button, and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Now before we get started with the actual ABS circuit that Jeff Sherb uh, published in Model Railroader back in March 2001, I first want to catch you up on a couple of things. First, I want to remind my UK viewers once again that I will be attending the Worley uh, National Railway Exhibition in Birmingham on November 26th and 27th. So if you're there, look me up. I'll be at the uh, DCC concept stand part of the time. And a lot of the time, I'll just be wandering around the aisles looking for new products, things to buy. So if you see me in the aisles, feel free to come on up, introduce yourself, and let's talk for a few minutes. Today I want to go over some answers to questions that came up in the comments from last week's video. Then we'll go into the circuit in a little bit more detail. I'll show you the circuit board, how it goes together, the various components, and then provide a little bit of a lead into a future video where we'll talk about wiring this up to your model railroad. Now, a number of questions did come up concerning speeds and the colors and, and the fact that this is really an oversimplification of the actual automatic block signaling system because there are a lot of other rules and signal aspects that you can add to it. So this is just its simplest, most basic form, red, yellow, and green. You can have yellow over red, you can have green over red, you can have all kinds of combinations of these different colors that mean a lot of different things. And also there are some standard rules. You can look them up on the internet. Look for the NORAC website, N-O-R-A-C, and I will put a link to that in the, uh, in the description. And it will give you a full listing of the standardized set of rules across the country. The thing to remember about that, and as I think they point out, um, these rules differ somewhat between different railroads, and they can also differ within divisions within a railroad. But they are basic rules. And I just am going to be using the red, the green, and the yellow signals. That's it. The reason for that is I think that for most operators that are going to be casually coming to operating sessions on my railroad, that they're not going to remember a bunch of complex signaling rules. Now there are people I know like Tony Custer and others who do operate with full-blown systems, full-blown signaling systems, and for them that's fine and they can require that of their operators. I'm not going to do it here because I don't think it's going to would work and I think it would just be more confusion. But what uh, what I do have is the Southern Railway rule book and you can see this one here is from August the 1st 1956. So I operate 1957, so this would have been effect on the railroad during my operating period. So you can see right here, this is the green clear signal that allows a train to proceed without any limitations. Then right here we have the yellow uh, approach signal, and that means that trains can proceed at medium speed. So a train would have to reduce its speed to medium speed, which would be 30 miles per hour. And there's a whole slew of different speeds. And then there's just the standard red signal, which means stop. Now there are other versions of stop, but you need to read the entire rule book in order, in order to understand all those various other uh, extended versions of signals. So that's why I'm going to stick with just plain red, yellow, and green and keep it simple. And somebody asked me about the various speeds. And on the Southern Railway, at that time, based on the research I've done, a limited speed would be not to exceed 45 miles an hour, a medium speed not to exceed 30, 
A reduced speed simply means to proceed prepared to stop. A restricted speed is the same, but not to exceed 15 miles an hour. A slow speed, again, not to exceed 15. And a yard speed would be a speed where you can stop within one half the range of your, range of your vision. So engineers had to know all of these different rules and follow them for safety on the railroad. And as I showed with last week's demonstration here on the bench top for how that signaling system works, it really is fairly straightforward for most operators to understand that if they get a red signal, they have to stop. If they got a green one, they can go. And if a yellow one, they have to slow down. What I want to do now is go back and, re and take a look at the Jeff Sherb circuit. And that's the one that I briefly showed you last week in the uh, video I did on automatic block signaling. As I told you back then, if you get interested in this circuit, the easiest way for you to get a copy of that article, go online to the Model Railroader uh, website and look at their uh, option for the Comeback or Model Railroader archive. And you can buy a one month subscription to that and download any uh, back issues and articles that you, that you need. But because of copyright laws, I cannot make a copy of the article and give it to you. I just can't do that. So I'm sorry, but that's about it. You're going to have to basically go on what I presented last week and what I'll present in this video, plus some ancillary material that I will all load onto my website where you can download it. And I'll put a link to that in the description. So take a look at the description if you're interested uh, and want to go ahead and try to build this circuit. I'm going to show you now a, uh, a diagram of the circuit that Jeff Sherb designed. And this figure is from the original article. And it shows the layout of all the components that you need. I will point out up there at the top that in that table of resistor values, the values for R1 and R6 are transposed. So in each case, you just have to flip those. So for example, for the 5 volt version, uh, it should be 150 ohms for R1 and 220 ohms for R6, and so on. So it's just a complete reversal. Also point out that this circuit will work with a 5 volt power supply, a 12 volt, or a 15 volt. Now I use 12 volt because I have a 12 volt DCC power bus under my layout. So it makes it very convenient. I can just tap the power bus and I've got 12 volts plus, 12 volts minus to feed into this circuit. And that's what you need if you're going to use the 12 volt. If you're going to use 5 volts, you need a 5 volt power bus. Uh, and so on. Now if we go on down at the bottom, you can see that this circuit is very simple. It only has a very few components. There's two transistors, there are six resistors, and there's one diode. And that's it. That's all there is to this circuit. And I checked, uh, I checked at all electronics and did a cost comparison. And the components for this circuit cost somewhere around $1.47, $1.50, something like that. Now, a lot of those, that is an extended price. In other words, you might have to buy 10 resistors as a minimum. And so I just divided by 10 to get the individual price. So uh, for ordering components, it assumes that you're going to be buying in bulk. And there are a couple of other components not shown on here, and those are the screw terminal blocks. And I got those at All Electronics as well. They're a quarter each, so that's 50 cents more. So all together, including the circuit board, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, you can build this circuit for, I believe, about $1.50. And that's unheard of. That's a very, very low price. Okay, let's move on. We'll get back to this circuit here in a minute. A few years ago, I went ahead and I hand built a set of three of these circuit boards following Jeff Sherb's circuit in the magazine article. And I built three of these, set them up like I did on the bench top last week, and tested them out. And sure enough, it worked fine, did exactly the same thing as the boards that I showed you. So at that point, I knew that that circuit would work for me, but again, I delayed because I did not want to get involved with building, hand building a bunch of circuit boards. Because 
As you can see from the back of this, that's all hand wiring, hand soldering, and all of these little connections. It takes a long time to build these, and I need a number. Well, finally, about a month ago, I found a uh, YouTube video about a program called Easy EDA. And I've provided a link above me here to the Easy EDA tutorial that's available here on YouTube. I'll point out that it's a two-part video, so make sure after watching the first part that you go to their link to the part two, because it goes into the details on how to access the program, use it, and then submit the files for printing. And it allows you to take an electronic circuit diagram that you already have and use an online, basically, drawing program to draw the circuit board that you want to build. And then you can submit the file that's created from that to a company that will print the circuit boards for you. So that's what I have here. I went ahead, did that, did the design in that program, submitted the file to a company in China, and they printed these circuit boards, drilled the holes, put the component names and everything right there on the, on the board for me. So all I have to do is bend the little uh, legs on the resistors and the diode and the transistors to the exact shape they need to go into these holes and solder them, clip them short, and I'm ready to go. So it, you know, it reduced it to a very easy, manageable process. I got 20 of these for $10 shipped to me from China, and that includes shipping. What I will do is I will make my files that are available and stored on the Easy EDA website available to anyone who wants to use them. So you can actually have those uh, printed out or saved in what's called a Gerber file, and that uh, a Gerber file controls uh, the design of the circuit board, the layout, the drilling pattern, everything that you need. And then you can submit it to the same company in China uh, whose website hosts Easy EDA, or you can submit it to a company here in the US that is available online and will print these out for you and create these for you. Let's take a look at the circuit. And for that, I'm gonna have to zoom in here and I'll show you the circuit up close. And then you can have an idea of whether or not you think this is something you want to go forward with building your own boards and putting together the signaling system for your model railroad. Okay, let's take a look at the signal board. Now, first, this is the signal board naked. So you can see it's got all these holes drilled for you. Uh, I also included the markings. So this is indication a G for green signal light goes here. The yellow signal connection goes here, the red goes here, and then down here at the bottom are the various other de designations for the wiring. So you've got a green out, detect in, yellow in, yellow out, and green in. So that's all there. The component names are given, R1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 for the resistors, the two transistors, Q1 and Q2, and the diode, D1 right here. And I even included the plus and minus markings for the diode and the little white band for it. So all you have to do is bend your components to shape, push the little wires through there, solder them on the bottom, and you're ready to go. So this is as simple as I could make it. Now, this is a completed board. So you can see all the components have been put in, soldered in place. You know it works because this is one of the ones I used for last week's demonstration. Wiring this, as I showed you last week, is very simple. Um, we have here a voltage plus contact. Now, you can either use these screw terminals, and they come like this from All Electronics, and these have a five millimeter pin spacing here. And that's the design that I used on the board. It gives you a five millimeter pin spacing, so you can just take these and soldering, solder them to the board, right, just like that, and it makes the con connection for you. And then you don't have to do any more soldering as far as the little wires go, because you can use these screw terminals here to make your connections. Okay, so let's look at the wiring then. This white wire goes to my voltage plus. So that's a 12 volt, I've got a 12 volt power supply, so I've got the positive wire white going to voltage plus here. 
Then I took the positive wire that comes from my signals, and I've shown you these in the past. I got these off of eBay from China, and they have a black wire that's common for all of these, and it's the positive leg of the LEDs. And then you have a red, yellow, and a green wire coming uh, that is the negative lead from these green, yellow, and red LEDs. So basically then, all you have to do is take that one black wire that comes from your signals and connect it also into the terminal with your voltage plus. And then your red, yellow, and your green wires from your signals go into these three terminals. And as I said, there's a G, a Y, and an R silk screen and printed here on the board so that you can find that real easy. Now, the other great thing about this is if you don't want to purchase 50, if you don't want to spend 50 cents for each one of these uh, boards to put in the screw terminals, you can actually solder your wires directly to these through hole terminals or contacts that I included here on the board. So you have that option of either connecting directly to, soldering directly to the board, or putting in the screw terminals. These are a quarter each, 50 cents. That's a big chunk of the board cost right there. But it makes it so much simpler when you need to work under your layout and wire these up. Okay, so we've got the positive voltage feed in here that powers the board. We've got the positive leg that powers the LEDs. We've got the three negative contacts that go to the individual LEDs. And then we've got the circuit here. And I'm not going to try to describe the logic behind this, but in the article that I showed you, Jeff Sherb goes into the complete detail of the logic behind how this circuit actually works. Now, if we go down here to the bottom, these wires, or these contacts here, screw terminals, uh, are for wiring the circuit up to your layout. And with the way that I showed you uh, that I was using it last week, I don't use approach lighting. I use the green light being on all the time, which greatly simplifies my wiring. Because in that case, all I need here is a yellow wire coming from one circuit board ahead of it back to this one, and then that would go out here into another one, and so on. So you've got your yellow in here and your yellow out here. So these just kind of daisy chain amongst the different circuit boards. Now, on this end here, we have the green out. So if you want approach lighting, you would run a wire from here to the next board, and it would come in here that is marked GI for green in. So green in and green out are right here. This is the detection feed. And for that, I use a NCE BD20 detector. So that basically feeds into this detect in contact or terminal here. And then I've got this other one. So this black wire is a negative feed from the 12 volt DC power supply power bus, and it feeds into the green. Now, that means that the green light will be on all the time unless another signal logic kicks in and overrides it. So that's going to be green unless there's a locomotive or a block is occupied two ahead of it. Then the yellow would be active. If the next block is occupied, then the, green, the red light would come on and the green would go out. So that's very straightforward as far as that goes. Now, one thing I will point out, uh, I did end up replacing the value of R1 here. I believe it was originally supposed to be something like 470. I had to increase it to a value of 750. And I will include that in a drawing uh, of the way that this is all set up and wired uh, that I will put on my website. And again, that will be listed in the description. So you can go there and download that. Now, I did not cover the wiring for the actual detectors. I just showed you that and used a, uh, a negative feed in order to do that. Because what you're doing is you're using the detector to basically throw a switch and feed that 12 volt minus right to this terminal here, the, the detect N. And that minus 12 volts is what kicks in and gives you a red or a yellow, depending on where the detection is. And that feed there is separate from this one here that feeds into your 
green in and gives you that green light all the time, except when it's overridden by the yellow or the red logic. Okay, so the way that that is set up then is, you basically take a short section of wire, um, this I believe is either 18 or 20 gauge, um, whatever the largest you can get through here twice is what you want to use typically. And it typically takes two turns through. So you can see I've got two complete turns going through this component here. And what that does is this gets connected into your power bus for one of your rails on your layout. And that will be your detection rail. And then if a train is on the track and conducting power between the two different rails, then the electricity flowing through here, the electrons, will actually induce a current inside this thing that looks sort of like a gravestone here, and that will trigger the circuitry to throw a switch here. And this part is fairly straightforward. Your negative feed goes in here on position one, your positive goes in here, and then your detect out would go here. And that's what feeds into the detect in right here on the circuit board. Very straightforward. So again, short 18 or 20 gauge piece of wire running through the center of the detector here, and that is connected to the feed to one rail, okay? And then you connect your minus 12 volt here, your plus 12 volts here, and then the detect out goes from here to the detect in position on the circuit board. And then this hand-drawn diagram here shows how you wire it all up. So this is set up for approach lighting. So you've got your green wires connected, interconnected, you've got your yellows interconnected, and then you have your detection signal in here. And I'll place a copy of this on my website for you to download uh, hopefully by Friday, but if it's not available by then, when you first check, check back in a couple of days, because it might take me a little while just to get all of this material set up for you. And then the only thing that you have to be aware of is how you go about setting up your feed to your truck. And that material will have to wait for a future video that I'll be presenting in a couple of weeks as soon as I get a chance to get back and get everything set up in order to do that. Well, that's a wrap for today's video. I know it's a fairly complex sounding issue when you start looking at how to go about wiring this in. Uh, building it, very, very simple because you have so few components and you just have to have a very fine tip soldering iron to be able to do that. So that's it for today. Have a great weekend, have a great week, and I'll see you again here next week with another video from the DCC Guy. Bye now.